Okay, so just to introduce Paula, who literally has just joined the team, although some has been has been working with us for a while. So uh, Paula's a, a senior dietitian that's worked in both adult and paediatric services, um, has a particular interest in mitochondrial disease, but also has a particular interest in sports nutrition as yes, well. So, so hopefully she's going to give us very helpful advice. Thank you so much. <laughs> It's so lovely to see you again and just such a privilege to be here. Um, many of you are, I already know, but for those of you that don't, I'm Paula Hines. I, I work as a dietitian, as Doug said. Um, I've been a dietitian for about 23 years in lots of different areas, but I'm particularly interested in mitochondrial disease because, um, in fact, I've written this talk from your perspective, not my perspective, because I realise what a massive impact nutrition has on your day-to-day -day living because of the, the levels of fatigue. So this talk is, um, there's not so many technical aspects, there's a lot being written about nutrition, but what I wanted to do is make it very practical. Please interrupt me as much as you want as I go through um, and ask any questions at the end or catch me in the break. Um, obviously this is gonna be on the website, so you know you don't need to take note of everything that's on here, but you know you can get access to that, yes. Oh, sure. Maybe this mic isn't working. <laughs> that one's up. Ah, that one? ah. That one? I'm just too small. Sorry. I'm vertically challenged. No, no, no you're not. How's you're not that? close enough to the mic. <laughs> oh, I like this much better. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this talk is about a subject that most of you will probably already know about. If you haven't come across intestinal dysmotility, it is by another word, constipation, but not in the sense of constipation that... Um, other people would have, you know, not many bowel motions over the day, that kind of thing. No, this is quite severe constipation and the symptoms are very unpleasant. So we've got some strategies that we can help you with this and I'm, I'm going to talk about those. Okay, so ID is intestinal dysmotility. Intestinal dysmotility is a severe form of constipation. So we're looking at not very many bowel motions in the week, quite severe abdominal pain, bloating, um, and all the upper GI symptoms, all the upper gastrointestinal symptoms that go along with that, such as nausea, sometimes vomiting, poor appetite. So some of you may have these symptoms already, might have seen me for this, but um, please, if you don't have these symptoms at the moment, if you might be likely to develop these symptoms or know someone who will, it's worth listening in and gathering that information for a time when it might be needed. So basically, sorry, I'll just go through the, the basics of why it happens. So the muscles of the intestine don't propel the contents through. So you would normally expect some contractility. So there's um, contraction down through the gut, propelling all the contents through, but basically this doesn't happen. So we have contents sitting in the gut for a very long time, um, and that's what causes all of the symptoms. So we found that there is a really high incidence of intestinal dysmotility in MILAS, um, but we also know that it's, it's very um, apparent in other types of mitochondrial disease. So it's not just MILAS, it is other forms. The incidence has been reported in about up to 70% of patients. However, our questionnaire found about 50 to 60% of patients have these symptoms. So it's quite a lot of people who, who have this. <coughs> So these are the symptoms I've just described, so it's pain and bloating, um, difficulty with passing bowel motions, bowel motions can be quite hard, quite solid, um, a lack of appetite and food intake. So over the week it might be just be one or two bowel motions over the entire week, so we're not just talking about daily motions being um, poor, it's, it's weekly. Um, so those are some of the symptoms. And when this gets really severe, um, there's sometimes no bowel motions at all, and um, that's when we have to stop diet. So we would maybe be looking at some um, nutrition into the veins and things like this if it gets really bad. So we just keep away from the intestine completely. So it can can progress to that, and that's something that we, you know, we have some management guidance for. So the first thing is actually acknowledgement. It's acknowledgement that there is a problem with this because people don't necessarily like to talk about bowels and that's not just that's not just people who've got constipation, that's everyone. So um, often as it becomes more of a problem, the difficulty is telling someone about it. 
um, because it can, can be quite embarrassing. Some people don't want to talk about that. So it's acknowledgement. It's actually telling someone, OK, I've got a problem with this um, before it gets worse. So tell the GP. As um, Dr. Schaefer said, Catherine is um, excellent in managing the symptoms of um, really severe constipation because there are some very specific things that we do and we have a pathway for this. So it's important that we follow that pathway and, and, and get a management plan in place as soon as possible. So as early as possible, the key thing is to tell people. Okay, and then we actually have some guidance that's been developed within the team that will help you, your GP, any relatives and carers that are helping you with these symptoms, other dietitians, other healthcare professionals, staff in other hospitals. So those guidance, I believe, are available on the website, but if not, they, you know, they are, they are going to be up on the website. Um, and that is to help people realise this is not just simple constipation. This is, you know, these symptoms are, are severe and um, affect your activities of daily living. So we need to know how to manage them. Okay, so the main management is laxatives and I know a lot of people find Movicol really difficult to take. Um, again, there are other laxatives out there, but where, um, you know, such as a GP might start something like fibre gel or say, oh, just have a high fibre diet, those things are not going to work for that type of constipation. So it's, it's literally, it's Movicol, and in fact, not low dose Movicol, high dose Movicol in most cases, um, because if you can imagine the contractility is not there, so things are not moving through, we basically need to get something to actually push the contents through. Um, and that's, that's why we need the really high dose laxatives. Um, the other thing is diet and hydration and water or any set of liquids are very very important if you're losing weight then maybe perhaps not water something with more calories in um, but the diet is very important I'm going to come on and talk about that a bit later and then maximizing time on feet so the more we're moving around that's getting the gastric contents moving as well so that's very important okay so diet I've just grouped this into things that are most important. So first of all, fibre. As I said, um, you know, a GP who maybe comes across you and doesn't know much about mitochondrial disease will say, oh, you've got constipation, we put you on a high fibre diet. No, it makes it much worse. In fact, it's, it, it does the opposite of what you would think. So fibre, when the bowel motion, motions are not moving, you, you basically get um, fibre swelling up, gathering water which then causes more pain and more bloating and worsening of the symptoms. So we actually suggest low fibre, the reason being that that helps things to just move through without swelling up and causing pain. Um, so it's a low fibre diet, it's modified fat. Um, as you know, fat takes a really long time to be digested in the intestine. So if we can spread the fats throughout the day and change the types of fat, that can also make a difference on, on the emptying of the intestine. And then fluids just help to move everything through nicely. So adequate fluids. And then again, the maximizing time on feet is just about you know um, helping with contractility of the intestine, also helping to move the contents through. So what does the low fiber diet look like? Um, so yeah, high fiber first. Let's say this is what you might be told to eat more of and it, it will make you worse. <laughs> Um, so whole grain cereals, so that's things like, um, you know, the high fibre um, cereals like bran flakes and such like Weetabix. And if you put Weetabix into a bowl and you add milk to it, it absorbs a massive amount of fluid and that's what happens in the intestine, which is why you get the bloating. Then things like wholemeal pasta, so again, it's the same sort of problem. Um, not that people would generally have the wholemeal pasta, but it's just so that you know if it's in addition, you had some symptoms, it, it was probably that. Then brown rice, um, all the things that we're told are very good for us, but when we've got these symptoms present, they make you worse. So fruits, vegetables, anything with skin, seeds and pips. Um, so that's the skin on the outside of fruit and vegetables and um, you know the pips and tomatoes and things like this. Also dried fruit and the seeded bread and rolls, so any sort of seeds and nuts and things take a lot of workload in the bowel and that's going to make the pain worse. So the opposite of this is the low fibre foods, which is what you can eat more of when you've got symptoms of um, this constipation. Cornflakes, rice krispies, the white bread, the white cereals, um, white rice and white pasta because they're very, very quickly processed in the gut and empty out of the gut quicker. So they're not gonna hang around there a long time absorbing water. 
okay, and then suggested meal plan. That's just an idea of what you might eat on a low fiber diet. So rice krispies or cornflakes, the white cereals, white toast, um, things like crackers and cheese. So the, the crackers because they're just like a white cereal. Um, then lunch, like root vegetable soups. So the root vegetables are absolutely fine. Potatoes without the skin, parsnips, squash, um, sweet potato without the skin. So you could make a soup with that or roast those um, and have some chicken in there for the protein and then like a white roll. And then in the afternoon, a white scum with butter, no fruit in it. Evening meal, meat, potatoes, things you would generally have as a dinner. It's just the type of vegetables that you would have to watch out for. So mainly going for the root vegetables and not the sort of green vegetables or things with skins on. Things like rice pudding are really useful sources of protein and energy. Um, and then bedtime again, the similar types of cereal and white toast. So there's still a lot that can be eaten on this diet, um, but we're just taking the fibre out. So, And then looking at fats, um, generally we we would tend to say, you know, just not really particularly pay any attention to your fat. But what I found is people are coming back to me and saying, actually, when I have fat, I really have some discomfort. So originally the diets were just low fiber, lots of water, maximize your time on, on your feet. Um, now we're starting to get people saying, actually, when I'm having butter and cheese and pastry and things like this, symptoms are worse. Um, so some of the oils, and I'm not suggesting you go out and buy these or, oh, you have to have these, but if you are having symptoms with some of those fats, um, then there are some fats you can buy that might not give you such bad symptoms. So coconut oil is um, what we call a medium chain triglyceride. So it's shorter chains of fatty acids instead of butter, which is longer chains of fatty acids. So um, it's more easily broken down by the gut. And that means it's digested like a carbohydrate. So coconut oil is, it doesn't really taste as much and it can be used for frying. It can be used in smoothies. I'm not a rep for coconut oil, so just in case you're wondering, sound like I'm going off on a tangent about it, but it, is, it doesn't taste of much and it's very, very healthy. So um, coconut oil is something that you can use, you know, in, in place of those other fats that you might have used before. And then olive oil, which um, if you've heard of the Mediterranean diet, is a really, really healthy oil um, that you can use. If you're wanting to gain weight, you can fry vegetables in this before making a soup. You can drizzle it over salads. Um, it's good for calories as well. So if you, I mean, you're not going to be having um, salad on a low fiber diet, but you can drizzle it over sort of root vegetables if you're roasting them, that kind of thing. Um, also avocados, which are a fantastic source of, of good fats. Some of the smooth nut butters, um, not using a lot of them because they might make the symptoms worse, but small amounts. And the nut oils, also a really good source of fats. And then obviously your fish, so things like um, mackerel and salmon. The key thing really is to spread the fats throughout the day and traditionally our diet might be quite low in fat on the morning so that's like your cereal and toast doesn't have a lot of fat unless you put tons of butter on. Lunch unless again there's a lot of butter and cheese and things might not have so much fat it's the evening meal so our traditional diet tends to be heavy on the fat on the dinner on the evening meal um, so what I would be suggesting is to spread the fats more throughout the day so have some with breakfast some with lunch some with dinner less with dinner and some sort of before bed so it's just spreading them out and again if anyone wants to speak to me about how we do that I can certainly help to get you a plan on how to incorporate that and then when the symptoms get pretty bad um, where you know it's very hard to sort of chew and swallow and get that food down because the the bloating's really awful um, it's a really good thing to be able to know what to do with blenderized diet. So this is where you get the food constituents and you add extra gravy or cream <coughs> butter, you know, any sort of fats into there and, and blend the food up. So you would be using a liquidizer and blend it. And it does mean that it empties out of the stomach quicker. So there's less chewing, which means your energy is saved. Um, it empties out of the stomach quicker. and you know, I think for a lot of people, it's just the fact that they don't have the appetite. So it can be useful where you just sort of, you can almost eat blended diet with a spoon. And it doesn't sound very pleasant, but there are lots of ways around it. You can separate the food so you've got different colors on the plate. So you would puree up the carrots and maybe with some olive oil or some butter, or you could roast them and then puree them up. And then your other root vegetables on a different sort of, um, 
you know, a side of that. So it's like you've got different colours on the plate. If you blend them all together, you get grey, which isn't very pretty. But you, you can do them separately and get the nice colours. It still looks like a dinner. Um, so there are ways of blending the dye. Also, um, when if the symptoms are such that you then can't sort of have potatoes and meat and things blended up, then it will be liquid diet. Um, we would be using supplement drinks then. Um, so go ahead. Oh, I'm, I've, I've got away from the mic, haven't I? I've gradually drifted back. I do apologise. <clears throat> so um, when things are, are really awful, we, we might then put in a feed-in tube. So what, um, the good thing is if you can communicate with us that actually, yes, yeah, started on this low-fibre diet, I'm now only eating half of what I should be eating, so now you need some supplement drinks or we need to start adapting that so that you still get the calories. Again, if you're on blended diet and only having half of that, then start to let us know we need to change things um, and add extra supplements or calories in. And if you're really not managing the food at all or you're vomiting it, then let us know we, could, we might need to use some tube feeding even for a short or a longer time. So there's lots of options there. Um, okay. There's some blended ideas. I want to just go, go past this because you're gonna have time to read that. Hopefully if you get the information off the website, there's lots of ideas there what you can do. So you can make up soups and add in cream, skimmed milk powder. Um, if, you, if you're not using those type of fats or don't get on with them, you can use olive oil, you can use coconut oil. Um, you, you can actually put in fish and do like a sort of fish soup as well if people really enjoy that and like seafood and fish. Um, then there's sort of the stewed beef that you can do as a meal, a composite meal, adding in skimmed milk powder, which is pure protein. Um, again, putting some cream and some other fats into that. So basically everything that you do have, you fortify because if you think if you've got a plate of stew and suddenly you're now blending that, you dilute it out, you dilute the nutrition because it, it, it is a lot when you blend it out, you're not gonna eat all of that in liquid form. You're probably gonna eat half of that portion because it's such a lot of liquid. So what we do is we start to blend it and then start adding things to fortify it. But you can come for advice on that if you feel you're not managing food in the solid form and I can advise. Okay, so that's just some of the ideas of blended. A liquid diet is much like soups and smoothies and supplement drinks. So um, we don't have many people who are actually on this at the moment, but mainly because it's very difficult to stick to. There's not enough calories in it. Um, nobody really likes to just have liquids on their own. So the chances are you're not going to be on this for very long. If, if you're only managing liquid diet, you're probably going to need a feeding line. Um, so those have they've got a peg feeding tube into the tummy or a nasal feeding tube into the nose. Um, we use that as a supplement to this liquidized diet. Yes, I know I'm going to have to stop. So I just quickly want to say about probiotics. Please have a look at this on, on the website if you're going to have a look. Where you've got stagnation in the intestine and the, the contents are moving through, we can get bacterial overgrowth. Bacterial overgrowth, you, you'll know if you have it because there are a lot of sounds going on in the intestine, um, grumbling and things like that. The bacteria produce gas, so there's a lot of wind and bloating, burping and things like this, it's really not pleasant. We give antibiotics for it, but generally once people get bacterial overgrowth, they're going to need repeated antibiotics because it does come back. So what I suggest is looking for a good probiotic supplement. If you catch me on the researcher tables, I've actually got some probiotics there that you can have a look to see what those are because they can limit the amount of times that you might need antibiotics. Um, support the gut while it's going through these um, unpleasant symptoms and generally probiotics are good for your, your health overall so it's not just the gut that they treat it's your general health overall. Probiotics need a food so they need a dinner and it's called prebiotics and I can give you lots of examples of the prebiotics that feed those probiotics that will help to support them um, because probiotics are good bacteria, so we want to, to, to fend off the bad bacteria that cause the overgrowth, and that's why we use them. Okay, okay so in summary, just if you do have um, intestinal dysmotility symptoms, please go and tell someone about it, don't keep it to yourself. If you're on laxatives, keep taking them. Um, in terms of diet, don't go on high fibre, but have low fibre, plenty of fluids. We can advise on vitamins and minerals, and the blended diet may be suitable. If not, we may use tube feeding at some point. And then finally, just any questions, and thank you for listening.